Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, MSP. It's a Ukraine war news update, second part thereof for the 30th of December 2023. Let's get to where we normally start, uh, which is the aid segment or military construction, production, um, and so on and so forth for both sides. Hopefully this video will appear on my normal channel. The, the, the first news video of today had to go, unfortunately, on my other channel because it was restricted here. I hope, hopefully this video will go here and this doesn't get restricted as well. Okay, so German aid to Ukraine. The Twitter handle, Twitter handle says, brief year end statistics. In addition to the military aid provided to Ukraine, 5.97 billion euros since February 2022, the Ger Germany has pledged Ukraine further military aid worth 4.93 billion euros this year. Most industry contracts run until the end or the mid or the end of 2024, but some do run until 2028. So Germany really stepping up. We're going to talk a little bit more about it's kind of Europe's stepping into the hole left by by the US. And there's some interesting t discussion to be had around that. Uh, in fact, let, let's just have that now. Uh, so when certain Americans, rightly or wrongly, I mean, you can, but this is open for debate, right? Say we shouldn't be carrying Europe here. Uh, Europe needs to step up uh, and we need to step back in terms of how much we support, say, for example, Ukraine in this matter that is predominantly European, although it has obviously geopolitical implications for the US. I would argue it is entirely about the US because this is Cold War 2.0, turning into very much a hot war. Uh, nonetheless, for the for those that say the US needs to step back and the Europe needs to step up, which is I I would broadly agree with that from a European point of view, but there is an argument you can make that the more Europe step up, the less dependent on the US Europe are. Now some Americans might argue that is good. We don't want Europe to be dependent on us, but in another there's another way of looking at it, which means that if Europe is dependent on the US, then US still maintains that hegemonic and geopolitical military strategic um it still heads that I guess hierarchy where where the US is at the top and they have dependencies on them. Now if you if you, if you say you need to step out of our shadow and, and take some responsibility yourself, Europe, it means that actually Europe doesn't need the US as much. It means Europe will then start developing a military industrial complex that is even more independent of the US. They won't be buying so much from the US. The US won't be so important to Europe, which means US actually becomes less important geopolitically. And another big entity, the EU, Europe, it, is on that that main geopolitical stage where you've got BRICS or you've got China to some degree, Russia, uh, and then you've got the US, and that, that was traditionally how it was. Where if you're saying, "Look, we don't want to fight this thing; it's not our it's not our war," uh, and Europe steps up, then that's great. But actually, it's a kind of is a zero sum game in terms of game in terms of power, whereby the US recedes somewhat in terms of global dynamics and power. So there is an interesting discussion to be had around that. You know, if you want to be isolationist and say, we're not fighting the, that war, that's your problem, then on the one hand, yeah, it's more fair. Europe is paying more and, and, and you know, sorting out their own problems or whatever, however you want to couch that. But, but the, the, sorry, the US will recede. Interesting. Uh, I think I think that's an interesting discussion as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, Britain will hand over several hundred anti-aircraft missiles to Ukraine to restore the one spent on repelling today's shelling. British Defence Minister has said Grant Shapps. So this is a really good um, straight up answer to that big old uh, missile and Shahid attack from not last night, the night before. Uh, Britain said straight away, we'll send 200 air defence missiles to Ukraine. Brilliant. Uh, that's great. And I, I love to hear that. And I'd love to see that from more nations. I don't know what missiles they're sending. I don't know how much uh, help air defense or whether it's like m more short range air defense stuff. Maybe the, the stormers, those self-propelled uh, air defense systems. I, I don't know. I have no idea. But at least, you know, the UK is, is stepping up there and saying something back to the, those, those strikes. You know, the UN can come out and say X, Y, and Z, but those are just words. You know, Ukraine needs 
actual actions there. So good on the UK. Uh, John Ridge here, who's a bit of an expert on these matters, says uh, to Julian Röpke. So y y Julian Röpke, Julian Röpke is a built tabloid, German tabloid newspaper uh, journalist, and he is. I've warned you about him before. Sometimes he says things that are really pro-Ukrainian and the right thing to say, and sometimes he his reporting is broadly in line with kind of pro appeasement positions and you've got to understand that you know the built is as i've said a number of times before is a is a tabloid newspaper that is going to be sensationalist and saying things that that quite often need to be questioned and so he said former three-star general commander at nato erhard burlitz it tells built that the united kingdom provided ukraine with nato version of storm shadow extending the cruise missiles operational range from 250 to 560 kilometers goodbye black sea fleet which is all good all, all correct uh and it's this idea and i talked about this uh, the other day that some people were thinking that the uk and france provided with their scalp uh, uk with storm shadow provided ukraine with the export version the black shaheen version that has a limited uh, range uh, to i think 290 kilometers and the fact that Theodosia got hit with those Storm Shadow missiles shows supposedly that they definitely don't have those, or at least they do have some uh, of the normal variants that have, I think, 550 kilometer range. Uh, John Ridge says, actually, this has been known from since the beginning. So I was, I was personally, I was unsure, but this is apparently known since the beginning. UK delivered Storm Shadows from RAF stock. The UK does not own or operate the export version, the Black Shaheen, which is manufactured by MBDA France. Uh, France likewise delivered Scout. EGs from AAE stock, so from the French Air Force, Air Force stock, so it says Julian remains a moron. Um, th that aside, uh, this is good news for Ukraine, that, that, that it appears that they do have the longer range missiles. The problem is that it could be that UK and France have dictated that they can't be used into Russian territory. They can be used into occupied Russian territory, occupied Crimean Oh, sorry, occupied Ukrainian territory, occupied by the Russians, but not into the Russian main territory itself. So uh, I, I guess we'll see. But um, yeah, uh, a bit of clarity there. Two Ukrainian new heavy machine guns here, uh, which are currently being tested in one of the research institutes. And this is good news. You know, Ukraine are still working to produce new weapons to bring to bear in the war. And talking about the kind of the impasse in Congress at the moment, which is deeply, deeply frustrating for someone like me, who's not so interested in the southern border. Uh, I know some people are like, how can you not? I'm not American. It is, is not as prevalent to me as the US aiding Ukraine, which has far more far reaching ramifications globally, geopolitically and, and to me as a British citizen. So I, I'm sorry to say this, and I've said this a number of times, and some of you can't, can't quite believe it. I was like, I don't understand how you can't believe what the, the southern border in the US isn't as important to me as a British citizen as the war in Ukraine. Right? That's just the way it goes. And so therefore, when I look at what Congress do, I'm obviously going to be, well, you need to release funding for Ukraine, and the southern border takes second place to the Ukrainian funding. Well, actually, Adam Kinzinger, who is a former lawmaker, Republican, I quite like Adam Kinzinger. I've listened to, I've watched a bunch of interviews of his. I know if you're, if you're a proper Trump MAGA Republican, you won't like him because he sat on the um, the committee that discussed, you know, the, the January the 6th insurrection and whatnot. So, you know, a lot of Republicans don't like him or will call him a rhino or whatever, a Republican in name only. But actually, I think he, he is a decent Republican politician. And it's a shame that he was basically ousted by that that, that very vocal uh, MAGA component of the Republican Party. But anyway, this is what he says. One of my former colleagues, especially those of you that served in the military. Because he did. You know... Ukraine aid has to get done, and it has to get done soon. I get the political pressures. I understand that like this is your one opportunity to get border security, and I agree. But you have got to get Ukraine aid done, and it's got to be done soon. You will never be able to forgive yourself, and history is judging this moment. This is the moment like prior to World War II. Do we take on the bad guy before we have to take him on in a much bigger way? Get Ukraine aid done. Every one of you, you know you need to. Hold out your votes for anything else until this comes up for a vote. 
Amen, brother. I mean, you know, I, re I retweeted that because damn straight. Damn straight. As a former military man, you understand this. Yes, he's saying, look, I understand the Southern border thing from, from an American point of view, but this is, this is bigger than that. Uh, and and I and I really agree. And we got to watch out for disinformation as well that is spread by these Russian trolls. So here's an example that pertains to the southern border. So I don't know. Some of you Americans might have seen this video uh, going viral. That that supposedly is the U.S. Uh, Mexican border, and <laughs> where apparently the border is just being overrun by you know Mexican cartel trucks driving through and oh my goodness uh, and so this this then gets amplified by russian trolls and it feeds into the idea that southern border is so so important for the for the american politicians to sort out but of course that is disinformation the video is posted by several prominent right-wing accounts earlier tonight claiming to show a mass invasion of the mexican cartel trucks from a border checkpoint in arizona has since been geolocated and sourced to a toll station in central colombia and was filmed in september 2023 it was, it was like, this is in a different country. It's just, this is in Colombia, and it's a toll station where you're supposed to pay tolls, but the toll station is open, and they're just going through the toll station. It's just a bit of traffic in Colombia. But if you, if you watch that and go, oh, my God, the Southern Ball is terrible, then that feeds into, and this is what Russian uh, troll farms and bot farms do, is they amplify this. They throw it out there on all these accounts. They retweet, retweet, and then it trends. And it trends, and people watch it, and they don't fact check it, and it trends even more. And it becomes this viral uh, phenomenon as a result of Russian disinformation projects. So be warned that what you watch might not be true. And it's the same for anything I show you, right? Hopefully I do some fact checking, but sometimes things get through. Now, the difference is I correct them if I know about them, right? Anyway. Kiev independent, moving on to geopolitical stuff. Western leaders condemn Russians' mass attack on Ukraine. Zelensky urges the world to re respond. So this is a response to the, the, the biggest attack since the beginning of the war. It's not the biggest attack full stop in the war. But what happened at the beginning of the war is they didn't count the stuff like they do now. So it, it's thought that the, literally the opening night of the war, there were much bigger or there were bigger attacks than there were two nights ago. You just it's not They weren't counted, right? But now, since they've started counting, this is the biggest attack. West, um, so, quote, it, the attack, is a stark reminder to the world that nearly two years of this devastating war, Putin's objective remains unchanged. He seeks to obliterate Ukraine and subjugate its people. He must be stopped, says Joe Biden in his statement. Exactly the right rhetoric. What you need with that rhetoric is actions to back it up. That's like what I was talking about with the UK there. I mean, we unfortunately, we don't have a lot of stuff we can back it up with. But, you know, it'd be great if... And he did call on... Uh, Congress to to you know sort it out to step up, but of course you know those words are effectively going to fall on deaf ears because they can't. It's not like Congress are going to go. Oh yeah, you're right, Biden. Yeah, we'll change that today. We'll we'll meet today and we'll we'll change that. So it just it takes action, and unfortunately that is all you know tangled up with with what's going on in Congress and the mechanisms of Congress. Right. Uh, like I was talking about with that with that kind of debate right at the top of this video in terms of the more the US allow or the more the US demand Europe to step up, the more Europe and the more they, they recede in terms of like, well, Congress is an impasse, we're not providing aid and, and that forces the, the EU to step up. The more that happens, the more the US receives in power, arguably. I don't know. Let me know what you think. But here, um, Giorgia Maloney, who's the Italian premier, says free military protection exists. So this idea that, that we get free protection from the US exists only in someone else's sphere of influence. It's time for Europe to wake up. Now, I'm going to try and read you what she says here because actually there's some really strong rhetoric. US support to Ukraine was never meant to win the war, but to give a false sense of security to European leaders and lull them back to sleep. This to maintain the US sphere of influence. So this is then the more the US take over and say we can do this and we can provide all, all the um, military equipment, the more that represses Europe and as this person says, sends them back to sleep. We're not needed and that actually in a sense helps the US to maintain being at the top of that power structure 
it's just this is a, uh, this is a really interesting area of debate. I'm not trying to be pro Europe or pro the US because actually uh, what I'm presenting to you are arguments from both sides here. Like I can see a really good argument that the US takes a step back and lets Europe stand up on its own, two feet more. But I can also see an argument that that will damage the US like grasp and control over world geopolitics and will, will means it takes a step back geopolitically speaking so i can see an argument for both sides here the truth is harsh but maloney is right time to step up and lead only the eu can bring russia to heel so this is that real pro-european stance now i'm going to read out the um the subtitles here but whoever designed these subtitles has put them in a in a way that makes them really hard to read anyway good luck me right so she says if europe decides uh as it has decided in recent years to entrust others with its defense, Europe entrusts others also with its freedom. So in other words, you know, we're entrusting our freedom to the US, which is, you know, you could argue that's dangerous because others don't defend you for free. So in other words, US in defending the EU or the Europe will exact a cost from Europe for so doing. They defend you as part of a sphere of influence. So them paying for the defense of Europe, them paying for the, the, the defense of Ukraine is them asserting a continued um, geopolitical power over Europe exactly what i've been saying and the money you save on weapons you will have to pay back in other ways this is what i've been explaining previously is that when the us is is exporting and this is what perun explained so well in his video ages ago about nato and exporting uh, and alliances exporting security is that many americans who are critical of e of the us uh, spending on defense aid to, to Ukraine don't understand that they get stuff back. There's no such thing as a free lunch. There's no charity going on here. Every penny being given, apart from us, apart from you and I that are spending our hard-earned cash to, to, to buy drones for Ukraine, that is charity. That is charity. But you could argue we get a gain out of that. That stability in Europe, in Ukraine, will feed back into our lives. Our energy uh, prices might come down. So you can see that even with us giving charity, there is a feedback loop going on where we it isn't just altruism. It isn't just moral altruism. There is a benefit to us you know, politically in terms of international security, in terms of our economies and trade and so on. But when it comes to nation states giving any aid to Ukraine, Ukraine. None of it is moral, or barely any of it. They will give some humanitarian aid, but in a, in a sense, that still feeds into the geopolitical game of chess that's going on. And so when the US gives aid to y Ukraine, there will be some in the US who say, we that's not our job to do that. We shouldn't pay for that. And the reality is that is, or at least the intention for those giving that aid, is that it, it, it begets a uh, a gain, a geopolitical, a power, a hegemonic, an economic gain for the US. So she said, I have always believed that NATO should be composed of two pillars, an American one and a European one. So this is then wrestling some power, she's she's advocating, wrestling some power away from the Americans and to the Europeans, because our destiny is certainly Western, like that of the Americans, she says. But our interests on a geophysical and geopolitical level are not always exactly identical. Europe must make itself be heard. Because Europe doesn't exist on a political level, doesn't exist on a military level, and doesn't exist on an external affairs level. And then we complain that we don't have any influence. I mean, this is such a cool area to debate. We don't have any influence. Either we build those uh, all those things and build our freedom and defend it or we will have to pay for it in other words we either pay america to do our defense and we pay them in terms of trade deals and influence and etc cetera, etc cetera, or we stand up we put the money in ourselves and pay ourselves but we reap the rewards of our, of our own dependency and our own freedoms i don't know the answer here i am kind of 50 50 split on the one hand, I kind of want America to do it partly because 
they're in the best position to do it because they have the best weapons and the most weapons. But on the other hand, the reason why they have the best weapons and most weapons is because they've placed themselves at the top of this hierarchy that has then meant that Europe has become somewhat impotent in this kind of peace dividend that we haven't built up our own armed forces. So we are relying on America to do so. So we, the argument for Maloney here is Europe needs to pay a shed loads more and remilitarize. And in remilitarizing, we establish a European uh, hegemonic status on the world geopolitical stage. And, and we pay our way and we will reap the rewards in terms of, you know, X, Y, and Z, yeah, e e economics and, and influence and so on. So really interesting debate to be had there. I'm literally 50-50. So like, I'm, I, hopefully I, I've, I've not come down on either side there because like, I, I really don't know the answer. I can see benefits for allowing the US to, to do everything. And I can see benefits uh, for the US doing stuff themselves, uh, the U EU doing stuff themselves. So let me know what you think. Uh, anyway, just in terms of that geopolitical uh, um, s landscape and with the UN involved, uh, we saw obviously the, the huge strikes two nights ago. Well, that then resulted in an uh, emergency meeting at the UN Security Council to discuss Russia's attack on the cities and civilians. And they discussed it and they said all the right things, but unfortunately, does that, will that result in anything actually happening? Uh, I don't know. Would it result in actions? UN Security Council criticizes Russia's air assault on Ukraine. Russia faced strong criticism during the UN Security Council session on the 29th of December following the largest air attack against Ukraine since the start of the full-scale war. Tragically, 2023 is ending as it began, is the quote, with devastating violence against the people of Ukraine. UN S Assistant Secretary General Khalid Kiari said after the briefing that uh, after briefing the council on the situation. So, yep, good, great. Okay, Russia, the bad guys, things are horrible. What are you going to do about it? Right. Okay. Now, this is where I get all a bit depressed. And I get depressed because I think, actually, I said, like, a year ago, and I'd love to find a video or videos where I said this on a number of occasions, Ukraine will win this war. The only way Russia can win this war, the only way, given sanctions, etc., etc., is if China helps Russia enough. That is the only way. Lo and behold, a year and a half later, China's exports of transportation equipment to Russia, that's everything from railway cars to autos and trucks, as well as aircraft and ships, have risen 800% since Russia invaded Ukraine. There is no bigger supplier of Russia's war economy than China. This, of all the news I've talked about in the last, I don't know, maybe since this war begun, this is maybe the most important. You, Ukraine... This is a, a war about economies. And I keep saying Ukraine will win this because the y Ukrainian allies have uh, economies that trounce Russia. And the, uh, as I said, the only way Russia can win is if they get China to balance that. And then we've got, then there's a lot of uncertainty. Oh my goodness, what's going to happen? China had been reticent to get too overtly involved, at least militarily, because they realise if the world sanctions China, they're screwed. They're already economically precarious at the moment. If things go wrong and, and the West, who are the biggest consumers of, of uh, Chinese goods, if the West start uh, sanctioning China, it's trouble for them. But they're playing this very careful game where they are providing a ton of stuff to Ukraine that isn't overtly military, but can be either co-opted or sustains Russia's economy to the point where they can be on a war footing and eke out this war for as long as they need it. These export, this, this, um, this graph is freaking scary to me. Like This is China stepping up and helping Ukraine. In what, uh, sorry, helping Russia. Sorry, my words are not very good with them today. They, helping Russia in a way that, uh, that is the most likely method for Russia to prevail. On the other hand, it's now official. Javier Millet, who is the kind of crackpot anarcho-capitalist leader, far-right populist leader of Argentina, 
he has some interesting positioning in supporting, very overtly supporting Israel, very overtly supporting Ukraine, and trying to move Argentina away from the sphere of influence of BRICS. So much so that, that Argentina had an official invitation that is now being officially uh, rebutted. So Malaya said, we ain't joining BRICS. And in fact, they want to take on the US dollar as their official currency. So it is, it is not just a rebuttal of BRICS, but it's jumping into bed with kind of the economic enemy of, of BRICS, the US and, and US foreign trade, you know, dollar being used as international currency of trade. Um, now, we've been, I talked yesterday about how Zelensky and Viktor Orban of Hungary are due to meet soon, while the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Hungary, Peter, oh, I hate this, I hate his name, Shijato, uh, it's not too bad, is it? And the head of the office of the President of Ukraine, Andrei Yermak, will hold a meeting in January to discuss the most pressing bilateral issues. Hopefully, that is good. Right, this is a bit of a sidebar next, but... This is worrying. Like in the UK, it shows that there have been very close connections from the U from UK in this case Conservative Party to Russia. Now, what's happened is Liz Truss, who who was Prime Minister of the UK for forty nine days, one of the shortest ever uh, um, tenures at, at the head of the UK government. She she gets to nominate people for peerages for the House of Lords. So we have the House of Commons, which is a representative parliamentary democracy, where we vote for people locally and the first pass, first pass the vote system. And they, 650 of them, then go to Westminster in the House of Commons. And in the House of Commons, they get to dictate policy or debate policy and enact policy and so on and so forth. But there's another kind of check and balance to that, which is the House of Lords. And the House of Lords are not elected. In fact, they are selected by usually the ruling party. And so at the moment, it is growing bigger and bigger. And this new uh, suite of people being selected to the House of Lords will push it over 800, I think it is now, which is ridiculously um, overweight. And it is also skewed, becoming more and more skewed because of the Tories have now been in since, was it 2008, um, 2010, 2008. Uh, so they, they have had all of these processes of selecting more and more peers to you know lords and dames to the house of lords is really you know is worrying and it needs a reform anyway just to give you the before we go back to ukraine and how it relates to ukraine former prime minister liz trust doled out peerages to the men uh, who play key roles in masterminding britain's exit from the european union so there's a very much a a, a pro leave whether you uh, who cares about that or whether you like that or not uh, anyway a lot of vo leave pro -bre brexit donors and people are getting to sit in the house of lords as a result of her being you know having uh, people behind her who are very much that way inclined and th and then it lists all the people that are either getting to the house of lords or who are getting like uh knighthoods and whatever from liz trust so she get i don't understand the mechanism here but i think because she was prime minister for a bit she gets to elect a bunch of people uh, or select a bunch of people who are going to get honours uh new it's called the new year's honour list uh and it seems just a, a bit of a broken system so it goes into detail of, of all the people and it's a just a list of people who i don't like at all um but, but let's buy the by anyway deputy liberal democrat leader daisy cooper said quote this shameless move to reward liz trust's car crash cronies so part of the reason why she on the main reason she only lasted 49 days is she got in quasi quarting as the the chancellor checker came up with some economic policies that were absolutely disastrous there were real free market uh, policies but they were basically tax cuts for all the rich screw over the 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 working class and blah 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 and it was all like everyone's like oh no this ain't cool actually you've you've gone over the tipping point here and it became a real um, a, a real car crash and she ended up being ousted and we now have Rishi Sunak who was the then Chancellor or was previously the Chancellor of the Exchequer um, under Boris Johnson. Anyway, 
This shameless move to reward Liz Ca Truss's car crash cronies is matched only by Sunak's weakness in failing to block it. Truss handing out gongs after blowing a hole in the public finances and leaving families reading from spiralling mortgage costs calls this whole honour system into disrepute. The honour system should celebrate hardworking people who have achieved great things. Selling the celebration just shows how out of touch the Conservative government really is. Of course, this is a critic of the government. Jonathan Ashworth, a Labour MP, said uh, this list is proof uh, positive of Rishi Sunak's weakness and a slap in the face of working people who are paying the price of the Tories crashing the economy. Okay, honours should be for those committed to public service, not rewards for uh, Tory failure. Rather than apologise for crashing the economy and driving up mortgage rates, costing families thousands, Rishi Sunak has nodded through these tarnished gongs because he is too weak to lead a Tory party completely out of touch with working people. So on and so forth. And then there's a lot of talk about how it should be reformed this whole process should be reformed it's absolutely correct um liz truss's re resignation honors list so as she resigns she gets uh, the ability to 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 get these honors this also adds more peers to the house of lords which already has 800 members making it the second largest legislative chamber in the world after china's national uh, people's congress sorry and it's not fit for purpose and then people are, like slagging that off anyway to go back to russia ukraine one of the people she has um she has given a peerage to is Matthew Elliott. And here's an article from 2012. So admittedly 11 years old, but my goodness, reading this article shows you how closely connected the Conservative Party has been to Moscow and how under this sphere of influence of Moscow it has been. So this was a trip organised in 2012 by a Russian spy. Elliott was a leading figure in the Conservative Friends of Russia. So it's a whole group of politicians who were like the friends, literally called the Friends of Russia. This is really reminiscent of what happened in Germany with the Kremlin paying for German politicians to go on jaunts to uh, to Moscow and then wondering why Germany is under such a sphere of influence of of the the, the Russians as it is. So this article is. I mean, goodness me, if you want to read an article that, that shows you connections of, of the FSB and Russia to our ruling political party, this 2012 article does it in spades. Oh, my goodness me. Um, but anyway, Luke Harding, the author, goes on to say, UK-based Russian spy who organised Elliot's trip was Sergei Nalobin. The goal was to improve relations with the Conservative Party after the murder of Alexander Litvinenko and to identify a new generation of Eurosceptic influencers so this is then um people who are friendly with russia then being told you need to be skeptic of the eu then they go back and then they generate the the brexit and you wonder why these people are so uh, anti-eu and so pro leave and then they end up getting honors by liz truss on the on the honors list and you're like, oh my goodness, this is all connected. And we, we've got this web of like Kremlin influence into Brexit, but that now continues into the freaking House of Lords as this guy gets a peerage from Liz Truss, which is a broken system anyway. Ah, Elliot says his trip to Moscow was a mistake. How convenient now. And he had no further contact with the Russians. But it's worth remembering that Brexit was a Kremlin foreign policy objective supported by an extensive social media campaign in 2015-16 um, and other covert measures. Now, whether you were pro-Brexit or not, this is kind of not about the pros and cons of Brexit. But the, the definite truth of the matter is that it was very strongly supported by Russia. And as I said, I've talked to you about this before, as I said to my dad when he was like looking to vote, well, he did, he was overtly, massively pro-Brexit. I was like, you do realise the main person that wants Brexit to happen is Putin. You've got to wonder why that is and whether it's a good thing that you want something that Putin wants as well. Uh, anyway, as I report my book, Shadow State, Russia's ambassador to the UK, uh, Alexander Yakovenko, boosted, boasted after the Brexit vote to another diplomat, quote, we have crushed the British to the ground. They are on their knees and they will not rise for a very long time. Elliot should now explain why he decided to go to Moscow and what contact he had with Nalobin. As he, as the Russia report points out, the government refuses to investigate alleged Russian interference in the 2016 vote. As one MP put it, they didn't want to know. So, yeah, I know some of you will get angry that I'm calling into question Russian interference with Brexit, but it is there. And the, the government, present government, has refused to investigate it. Why would you refuse to investigate how Russia has, has been meddling in our politics? And, unless it's embarrassing, unless you know the conclusions will be embarrassing. Anyway, I know this is another thing that's going to piss off like some of my viewers because you're really fans of of 
of Brexit and leaving the EU. But I want to know why, well, I know why Putin wanted Brexit to happen so much, but I want to know how much involvement there was. And I also want to call into question how uh, or, or why, you know, conservative politicians are getting peerages on the back of, of you know, such overt collaboration, it seems, with, uh, with Moscow, at least previously. Right. On a similar note, let's pick on France now. So Shashen Joshi from The Economist says, Russia has been increasing its efforts to undermine French support for Kiev, a hidden propaganda front in Western Europe that is part of the war against Ukraine, according to Kremlin documents and interviews. So this is in the Washington Post. But, uh, quote, Sergei Kirienko, the first deputy chief of staff in President Vladimir Putin's administration, was ta- has tasked Kremlin political strategists with promoting political discord in France through social media and political figures, opinion leaders and activists. Citing opinion polls, the Russian strategist noted that 30% of the French retained a positive view of Russia, the second highest among Western European countries after Italy, while 40% were inclined not to believe reporting on Ukraine. Wow, 40% of French people, according to that poll, do not believe reporting on Ukraine. They would not believe the sorts of things I report because it doesn't fit their narratives. Remember what I said about you know, that guy on a train in America just not believing a report on inflation saying that's not true, it's double that. Just pulling that opinion out of his ass. We can pull facts, supposed facts, out of nowhere and take on the, these alternative facts and build worldviews and, and political landscapes around the these narratives that are ostensibly false. We are living in a post-truth reality and we need to be very aware of what we are being fed by others. And that includes me to you and I'm sure many of you will question what I say. And I will have my biases, of course I will, but I am really st- striving towards the truth. I know I'm being contacted again by um, by W. Bin over Tusk and, and my claims about TVP and Tusk. I will look into these as and when I can but but and correct if, if necessary but for me Donald Tusk is far far more preferable in position in Poland to to fight uh, the in, the uh, expanding Russian influence in that area than than PIS the Law and Justice Party uh, I would have Donald Tusk over Law and Justice Party any day of the week um uh, and that's a kind of moral consequentialism. I, if, if it comes to that, that I will advocate. Um, so yeah, we, you know, call into question what I say, but but you know, calling to question what you are receiving from other places. I showed you that video of the supposed border I- influx from Mexico, stuff like that. If if you if you are being, if there are messages that are being amplified that that fit well with you. It's still that's probably the best time to question whether those are true. Do, are you suffering from what's called confirmation bias, where I I give more value to stuff that confirms my biases and my um, my conclusions than I give to things that go against that. And if I go against your conclusions, you ascribe less value to me because you don't like what I say, and then you will go and seek something else that does support your conclusions. And that is confirmation bias. We all have it. I have it. I have it as much as you. We need to understand that it's there to try and mitigate against it. Right. And just the last thing I'm going to say is just moving towards, and again, this kind of this full circle, I guess, goes back to what Georgia Maloney was talking about in terms of Europe stepping up and to replace the US in terms of being that that power, that source of power. German Minister of Defence Boris Pistorius recently stated that the removal of conscription from German law in 2011 was a mistake and due to ongoing troop shortages in the Bundeswehr, it may soon be re-established as a requirement for certain men and women who are German citizens to serve in the armed forces for up to a year. We are looking potentially at a remilitarization. Why? Because actually the peace dividend has brought us to a position where Russia are able to take advantage of our weakened position. And you know this all fits together like a bit of a jigsaw anyway sorry to bang on there's been a lot of analysis and me given my political opinions uh but you know hopefully you can see that there is at least some basis to what i say it is at least somewhat evidence i'm i'm hopefully not pulling stuff out of my posterior uh thank you for watching please like subscribe and share and and can i just say one more thing lots of people are saying they've been unsubscribed from my channel like literally twice in one day yesterday several people saying that please check that you are subscribed still and please click on the bell and make sure it is selected it gives you an options of how much information you want and you want all rather than personalized and that means that that you should be notified of my stuff much more 
than if you only select personalized. But make sure you are still, still subscribed because funky things are happening in the world of YouTube. Take care. Speak soon.